if you are not in our church directory, we have a lot of people who, you don't have to be a member just to be in the church directory. If you are a regular attender here and you want your information there so we can get a hold of you, uh, please fill this card out and we will get a new church directory printed as soon as we get them all in. So, luckily, I didn't have a whole lot of stuff on a slideshow and I have notes printed off. So, um, luckily, we'll still be able to go on with the sermon. How many of you guys have had a situation come up, something that you might have been able to do in the past, and then now you're finding yourself struggling with it or seeing yourself failing in trying to do it, and the frustration that that brings? Or the person who taught you how to do that knows that you can succeed at it and then watches you fail at it and the frustration it brings to them. Today we're going to be looking at Mark 9, 14, 14 through 24. I've cut a couple of the verses out, but it's scripture that we're used to, used to reading about. And no, it's not a sermon about casting out demons. Uh, that is what the disciples were doing, but we do not have the gifts to do that. We do not have the, apostate, uh, the apostles' gifts. Um, that is a whole different sermon there. But if you guys could please join me in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. I'm going to read down through verse 19, and then we'll talk about it. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. So setting the scene for the disciples trying to cast out this demon, there were nine disciples down there in that crowd by themselves. Why were those nine disciples by themselves? Jesus, up with Peter, John, and James, was, they were all up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They just saw the glory of God. They just saw Jesus in all his glory. They saw Moses. They saw Elijah come down. They were able to see this amazing scene. And then they walk down and they see this big crowd around their other nine. They're like, what's going on here? Jesus comes up. Why are you arguing with the scribes? What's going on here? The other nine had tried to cast that demon out, but it had failed. At this point, we might ask ourselves, is this something that they had the power to do? If you jump back to Mark chapter 6, 7 and 13, Jesus had already given them this power. When he sent the 12 out, he summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits, jumping down to 13. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So the disciples weren't acting out of character. They weren't doing something that they weren't used to doing at this point. The disciples had done this many times when they went out in pairs. So there was something else here. There was something that was different about this time. And when you look at Jesus' word, he kind of gives a little hint to it right here. Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? And he says, bring him to me. While they're bringing to him, the demon automatically, as soon as Jesus makes eye contact with the boy, the demon automatic, automatically notices who this is. He automatically knows that he's already defeated. Jesus asks the father, how long has this ha been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Starting in verse 22. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Let's stop right there for those two words that the father said. But if you can do anything. So here the, fa the father of this boy had already brought this boy who was demon-possessed to Jesus. Already said, hey, we got to give this a shot. So he already had some faith there. He was already like, all right, Jesus... Jesus can do this. And then after the disciples had tried and failed, he was like, well, if you can do anything. Jesus' response is priceless. He, here he is in more frustration. Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for him, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cries out and said, 
I do believe, help my unbelief. That's where we're going to spend most of the time. I do believe, but help my unbelief. How many times have we been stuck in something that we know God can deliver us through? We know God has gotten us through this struggle before, and now we're having more trouble with it than what we normally do. And we're standing there, and we're like, God, I believe. Where's this doubt? Where's this unbelief coming from? The title has said, Weakness and Doubt, O Lord, Help My Unbelief. Weakness and doubt and this ye of little faith is something the disciples were used to. We're going to look at some texts later on that are going to show four times before this, Jesus had told the disciples, O ye of little faith. If Jesus was sitting here today, I was talking with Willie uh, this morning, and we have this building transition going on, and it's scary. There's not a person in here who's sitting in the decision-making process of that who's not, wow, that's a lot of money, and we have to do something. And it's scary. But would Jesus come in here at this point and say, oh, ye of little faith, why aren't you trusting me? You're concerned about the money. You're concerned about the debt. You're concerned about how many people are here now and if we'll be able to cover that. How many times do we walk through in our faith, in our relationship with Christ, and we operate in what we know we can do? We operate in, well, I know I can make this happen, and it'll be good for the kingdom, so let's do that. Not, if I step out, I have no clue if there's going to be something under my feet. But God, this is where you're calling me, and this is where I'm going to go. Yes, I still have a, <clears throat> a bit of the Aviano crud, and I'm sorry, that's why I got my big water up here. But <clears throat> Jesus was looking at his disciples, knowing that they could do this, knowing that they could cast out these demons. And he was like, why you unbelieving? In Matthew and, Mark's, or in Matthew and John's account of this, he calls them an unbelieving and crooked generation. He's saying, there's, there's something wrong with you guys. You guys aren't thinking right now. In, yeah, Matthew's account, verse 19 and 20, it says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here. Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. If we have faith the size of a mustard seed. I, I looked up a lot on that one because I was like, well, wait a second. You're saying, oh, ye of little faith. Well, the mustard seed's a, a, a little seed, right? That's, in, in agricultural terms, in that area, that's the smallest seed knowing that they plant. So why does he use that as, as a, a point there? Jesus talked a couple of times about a mustard seed. In, sorry, right there. In Matthew 13, 13 through 13 and 32. Well, 31 through 32. I'm typing dyslexic now, too. So in 31 and 32, he gives them a parable about a mustard seed. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is, a lar it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So, O oh, ye of little faith, but what is little faith? Little faith is having something in your hand, something that's tangible, and saying, All right, God, I can trust you in this. Let's go. Little faith is, let's say, finding a building that we can afford right now with our church budget the way it is and saying, All right, God, this is, this is it. We can do this. And we're going to move on. Little faith is saying, all right, God, the answer's right here, and I know I can make this happen, so let's go. And I can trust you in this, because I can see that we can make this happen. Great faith is saying, all right, God, you have an answer here. And I'm not downplaying the decision process in it, because the decision process is going to be through a lot of prayer, through a lot of sitting there and racking and being like, God, is this really where you're calling us? And then those making the decision are going to hear that voice from God and say, yes, let's go out. 
but the answer, the tangible evidence of us making it might not be there. But yet God might be saying, this is where I want you to go. That's great faith. That's the faith that could have cast out those demons. I started out by saying, is there things in your, in your life, is there things in your Christian walk that you used to be able to do, and they were easy, and you had no problem? You used to be able to walk out and witness to someone. And now, as the years have gone by, it's harder. It's harder for you to get that strength. God, why is this? Is God giving you more of a challenge? Is God saying, pray for the strength, pray for the strength, pray for the strength? There's been times where you might have prayed for someone to come to Jesus, and through like two praying twice, they come to Jesus. And you're like, wow, that was quick. That was awesome. But now the perseverance is the test. Are you going to keep praying? Are you going to stay there and persevere through? These nine disciples, they had cast out the demons. There had been no problem before. They might have been, hey, demon, come out in the name of Jesus. And boom, they were leaving. Now they're getting further on in their walk with God. They're getting further on down the road. Jesus is about to leave. Jesus is about to leave and give them the Spirit and not be there to bail them out every time. Are they going to persist? Are they going to keep moving on? Or are they going to pray twice and say, oh, well, this one must be too hard for Jesus. Let's move on and find something else. Are we going to be that person who later on in our faith, we find something that we pray a couple of times for and we're like, God, this one's just too hard. Where I work now is just too dark. How can I live for you there? This new challenge you put in front of me is just too hard. If Jesus were sitting here and walking with us, he told the disciples four times up, up until now, O ye of little faith. But if he was walking with us, talking daily, and saying, O ye of little faith, how often would we hear that? Let's take a couple looks because it'll give evidence of to situations in our lives that we have little faith in. In Matthew 8, or I'm sorry, start off Matthew 6, 30. Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. He's sitting there instructing all of his disciples. He says, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? These disciples were so concerned about how they were going to be provided for, but yet you look at nature and you look at how God takes care of his creation, and the answer is right there. God's going to give us what we need. The disciples were like, well, how are we going to eat? How are we going to be clothed? How are we going to be able to do your ministry? He said, just have faith in me on it. Just step out. In Matthew 8, 23 through 26, they had just got done with the Sermon on the Mount. They were going to the other side, and starting in verse 23, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. So here they were. Jesus was sitting there. He wasn't worried about it. He was like, yeah, we're going to be fine. We're going to make it. It's going to be rough. There's going to be challenges. And they started freaking out. They're like, aren't you going to do something about this? We're going to die. So why do you guys still not have faith in me? In Matthew 14, 28 through 31, Another storm. This time, Jesus, Jesus let the disciples cross the, the sea on their own. And a storm came up while they were crossing. And Jesus started walking out to them on the water. If, if you remember this story, if you've looked through, the, the disciples at first, they were like, what, is that a ghost? Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and, be and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? The last one we'll look at is Matthew 16, 5 through 8. Disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. 
Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They began, they began to discuss this among themselves, saying, he said, that because we did not bring any, he said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Why are we discussing the worldly? Why are we afraid of the storm? Why are we sitting there and wondering if God's going to take care of our needs when there's other battles out there to be fought? Why is it that when God calls us to do something, we try once or twice and, oh, there's some resistance. I'm going to step back. Why is it that we allow our faith to be so weak? Why is it that in the struggles and in the day-to-day -day life, we can, we can be okay with the fact that, all right, God, I can trust you in this. I can see the answer. But when God calls us, even a PCS is pretty, pretty simple. Well, unless you're in a hotel for way too long. <laughs> but we know that, okay, well, if everything doesn't work out, Uncle Sam's going to take care of the, the needs there. But when God calls you to move, when God calls you, maybe he's calling you to get out of the military, and you're like, where's my security blanket going to be then? If God's calling you to go out and be a missionary, if God's calling you to go out and do something, and we're like, whoa, I don't see the immediate answer there. I can't be sure of my security anymore. And now we start to doubt. Yeah, we may take the initial step. We may go to MPF and say, okay, how would I get out of the military right now if I could? And we're starting to step out of that boat. We're starting to step out of that boat. Yes, I'm from North Dakota. There's my accent. We're starting to step out, and as soon as we find out we might have asked the wrong question or let the wrong person know we wanted to get out, now we've kind of got ourselves in over our head. Now we start to wonder, God, why are you bringing me down this road? And we start to sink, not knowing... God, I'm going to trust you. This is, the, this is where you've told me to go. I'm going to go. We're still concerned about if we're going to have what we need, if all of our needs are going to be met. There's one other story in the Gospel of Matthew that really gives answers into how, how we can be sure that we're going to get the answer that we need. Matthew 21, 20 through 22. This was at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. They were, they were going into Jerusalem. And if you, if you read in Matthew's account, it kind of gives it, breaks it all down into one story. If you go into Mark, it gives the example of a few different days. But Jesus is walking into Bethlehem, or into Jerusalem, sorry. And at first, he sees this fig tree, and he's hungry. He's like, there's no food here. And he curses the fig tree. Disciples are like, what's going on here? And they go into Jerusalem. The next day they walk back through, and the fig tree is withered up. Like, whoa, he just did that. The disciples ask him, how can we do this? In Matthew 21, verse 20, seeing this, his disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. If we pray and do not doubt. If we say a prayer and we act out on faith saying, God, this is, I've been seeking your will and this is where you want me to go and I'm praying for it and I'm going to step out and do it. Or do we pray and say, God, I think this is where you want me to go. Should, give me a sign. Open a door. Close a door that will block me for sure and make me go down this path. God, don't, don't even give me an option of not following you. How often do we sit there and use it as an excuse to sit idly by because we're sitting and praying for a sign from God? When we know that in what he has already told us, he's given us the answer. 
the uh, Sunday school class upstairs, we're going through James. In James 4, verse 2, it says, you receive not because you ask not. We pray for things. We don't pray for things, so we don't receive them. But then in verse 3, it says, when you do pray, you ask with the wrong motives. You ask out of selfish ambition, selfish gain. So when we do pray for things, when we do ask God to bless us in a way, when we do ask God for the answer, are we really asking for our own gain? Or are we asking to glorify God? So now that I've put all the verses out there, when we walk through this story, we see from the beginning that the disciples are out there, they're having trouble, they're arguing with the Pharisees. Jesus comes out, he's like, what's going on here? The father, the father is finally the one who speaks up. The disciples wouldn't speak up because they were ashamed that they couldn't do what they knew they had the power to do. They're like, well, we should be able to do this. We're, we're ashamed. We go out and someone asks us, what, what have you done for Christ today? We might be ashamed to answer that because we know that we've had the opportunity to share him and we haven't. The father comes out and he's like, I brought my boy to your disciples. Well, actually, I brought him to you. I thought you were going to be here. Your disciples couldn't have cast him out. Just says, bring him to me. He's already frustrated because he knows that his, his disciples should have been able to do this. He says, bring him to me. How long has he been like this? Since birth. If you can do anything. It's like, okay, so I have disciples who are leaving. I have you who's unbelieving. Gives him that rebuke, and the father's like, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. The disciples had faith. The disciples had faith. Otherwise, they wouldn't have attempted to cast out the demon in the first place. The father had faith. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought the boy to the disciples, brought the boy to Jesus in the first place. They had faith. The question is not complete unbelief here. The question is doubting in the middle of the trial, doubting when things get tough, stepping back and saying, uh, God, yeah, that's probably where you want me to go, but it just got too hard. You're calling for something more than what I'm willing to give here. Help us in our unbelief. We watch our lives, and we watch that daily battle that we have with sin. We watch that daily battle where... God, I want to be on fire for you. And he gives us the challenges for us to be on fire for him. He gives us the roadmap to do it. But then when things get tough, or when at work we get challenged, we're like, yeah, I just, I don't know about that. I don't know if I can persevere through this struggle. When he gives us the challenge to witness to someone, and we start talking to them, and they're like, yeah, I don't believe that. And we're like, okay. It's not us who wins them over. It's Christ. But do we pray? Do we ask God to give us the words to say? Or do we go out on our own? Go out in our own strength? The disciples thought, yeah, bring that boy over here. We can do this. We've done it many times before. In Matthew 6, they had cast out many demons. He said, yeah, bring them on over. We got this. How often do we say, yeah, bring that challenge on over. We got this. And we're operating in what we know we can do. We're operating in the tangible. We're operating in what the church budget is, and we're going to find a church building that we can get because this is where our budget is, and we know we can make it happen. We can make that payment because, well, that's the money we're bringing in now we'll be good. Or are we standing up and saying, God, this is your church. This is your house. I am your child. Where do you want me to go? Where do you want us to go? And let's do it. It's going to be scary. We're going to step out like Peter and we're going to be like, dude, I'm walking on water. This should not be possible. This isn't possible. And then we start to sink. How do we stay in that this should not be possible, but that's my Lord and Savior right there, and I'm following him. We keep our eyes fixed on the prize. We keep our eyes 
on that goal and we say, Father, I'm coming straight to you. God wants to take us to miraculous places. God wants to use us in ways where we look back two years down the road and we're like, I shouldn't have been able to do that. How many Christians sit in their life and can't look back and see God use them in any miraculous way? They look back and they're like, God, I just don't... Where, where was the power? And one of the commentators said, unbelief strips the gospel of its power. When we lack the faith, when we lack the understanding that God can move mountains, faith the size of a mustard seed will move a mountain. Okay, please don't go out there and say, I have faith, let's move these mountains. Because it's got to be within God's will. It's got to be within God's plan. But faith the size of a mustard seed, if you are operating in God's will, if you are letting God use you, faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. <coughs> Sorry. The answer is have faith, pray, and do not doubt. <clears throat> the answer to our lives, the answer to everything, it's as simple as reading the word, being in prayer. It's as simple as, okay, I'm going to start waking up a little bit earlier and reading the word. I'm going to start having more of you in my life. God, I'm going to start letting you strip the bad out of my life and replace it with you. It's as simple as that. But yet, isn't that the hardest step? How many years in a row have we made the New Year's resolution of, I'm going to read through the Bible this year? Or, I'm going to wake up every morning and I'm going to read your word. God, I know that there's power out there to be had. I know that you are the power and I want to tap into it. And the way to do that is to dive into your word. The way to do that is to surround myself with you. And I want to do that this year. Most of us at least once or twice, maybe every year, have made that New Year's commitment. We've been like, God, this is the year. We're going to do it. Maybe you last January, maybe you last six months, but do we see it all the way through? Do we read through the Bible that year? Do we spend the time with God? Do we say, you know what, God, I may not make it through the Bible this year, but if I make it through three chapters and I've dove in and we've spent every morning together and I've, I've watched your power this year, that's what he's asking for. He's asking for us to turn our life over to him. He's asking for us to spend the time with him. Weakness and doubt, O Lord, help my unbelief. O ye of little faith. How often would we hear that if, if we were sitting there walking as the disciples were? How often would we come up to a struggle and hear God say to us, Really? Again, ye of little faith. How often in church life, not just this church, but every church, do we operate in the tangible of what God can do, not what God wants to do with us? How often do we strip away the power of God because we look and we're like, I shouldn't be walking on water. This isn't what I can do. And we start to sink. This power that we've been talking about is only available to those who have the Father. This power that we've been talking about is only available if you have some belief. Excuse me. Complete unbelief. Complete unbelief is without God. Complete unbelief is not believing at all in the power. Gotta love this, Aviano Crut. Complete unbelief is operating and saying, God, yeah, I don't know if I believe any of this. If you don't have some faith, you don't have the Holy Spirit, and none of this really makes any sense to you, anyways. 
The Bible says the word of God is foolishness to those who do, do not know him. For those who are here today, if, if all of this just doesn't make any sense, if all of this is just words and you're like, what's this guy even talking about? Do some searching. If you want to come up and talk with anyone, there's, there's people here to talk to you. There's people here who would love to show you that Jesus is the answer. There's people here who would love to show you what the Bible says about your life, what's going to happen one day. For those who this seems all too familiar with, for those who this is our daily struggle, we look at our lives and we're like, yeah, I should be able to move mountains. I should be able to do great things for God. He, God should be able to use me and work through me. But I don't see any of that. That's when it's time to get on our knees and pray. That's when it's time to say, God, I want you to use me. I want to see your kingdom come. I want to see you be glorified. If that's using me, great. If that's not using me, then let me help someone else glorify your name. God doesn't want to sit idly by or have his, have his workforce sitting there doing nothing. God wants his workforce to be out there doing something. <clears throat> but if we're not tapping into that power, then we're not relying on him. So it leaves us to a point. Are we going to allow these struggles to come? Are we going to be sitting there like Peter? Are we going to be sitting there like these other nine? See what God has put before us. All right, I'll give it a shot. I prayed about it a couple of times. It just ain't happening, so we're going to walk away. Is that where we're going to be? Or are we going to say, God, this is your answer. I keep going back to where our church is at. God, you've given us the spot. We pretty much have to move buildings. We have to, we have to leave. There's, there's a decision that has to be made. All right, God, we're going to operate in your realm, and where do you want us to go? We can't just read this story and leave it at where it's at. We can't just read this story and not at some point see ourselves somewhere in there? Are we the boy's father? Did we bring something to God and say, well, if you can do anything with this? Did we pray with that much doubt? Did we put something at, Jesus, at God's feet and say, well, God, if you can. There was a musician uh, in my hometown. Well, I say hometown because if you're from North Dakota, it's your hometown. So if anyone's from North Dakota, they're from my hometown. But he sang a song that said, forgive me for believing in a God who's so small, who would only move the mountains and only save me when I call. Doesn't care about the little things, will only act if I call. How often is that the God we believe in? Are we bringing something to God and saying, well, if you can do this, if it's worth your time, or do we know that the God we serve wants to be in every part of our lives? Do we know that the God we serve wants to have an intimate relationship with us, wants to have a part in everything we do? And we just shut the door on them half the time. We just say, nah, this ain't for me. Are we the disciples who pray about it a couple of times? Are we the boy's father who says, well, if you can? Are we okay with seeing ourselves in either of those positions? If not, the altar will be open, and you can come up here and kneel at the altar. You can lay it at God's feet. If none of this makes any sense, and you're wondering what this salvation thing is or how you can see any of this power, you can come up. I'll be up here. Richard will be up here. You can come up and you can, you can ask us about that. But are you okay with just leaving it where it's at? 
you don't have to come up here and use the altar. You can do it right there in your seat. You can pray, God, I want to see that power. You can pray for, to, to be able to see God's kingdom come. You can pray that God will use you. It's what God wants. Yes, it's going to be challenging. Yes, there's going to be times where, where we, may not, we may not succeed. We may fail. But God's there just like how Peter failed, and he fell. He started going down. Lord, help me. God's going to be there. Are we okay with the chance of God looking at us and saying, Oh, ye of little faith. As the praise team comes up here and sings a song, they're going to close us out today. Um, just be thinking about that. Use this week as an opportunity to say, God, where, where are you going to be? Where, where's my next battle? Where do you want me to fight? As we close in prayer, I just pray, Lord, I pray that God will see you through this. God, as we take these words, as we take this, this story where people had faith, but it just wasn't faith that would persevere. I pray, Lord, that throughout our lives, in everything we do, I pray, Lord, that we can seek you. I just pray, Lord, that we can use this week to look back on the challenges you put before us, this, the, the times where we can rely solely on you. And Lord, give us this strength power to work through us. This is my holy name. Amen.
please, as we go out, we're going to say a closing prayer for them. And then the worship team is going to send us off with a great song. Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, lift Carlos and Naomi and the whole family up to you. Lord, we pray, Lord, that as Carlos is out doing what you have called him to, God, we just pray, Lord, that you keep him safe. But that's the easy part. Us being down here. We just pray, Lord, that you be with Naomi, be with Carl, be with the whole family. Lord, just uh, give them the strength to make it through this time. Give them the courage to know that if they need help, they can ask for help. Give us as a church family the ability to be there when we say we need you. When we say we need you to stand up. us the strength, give us the courage to walk through our daily lives and to glorify your name. God, we love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Sing this with us. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us, Jesus. So glad you came to, you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. From the earth to the cross. My debt to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name. You came, you came from heaven. Show the way from the earth to the cross. My death pay, and from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on. One more time, Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday.